Welcome to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Carol Massa. And I'm Jason Kelly. We're here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York. This week, Business Week turns 90. A look at how the magazine has covered business through the decades. Including women on Wall Street. This week, Me Too and why many financial firms arguably still don't get it. Plus, how climate change helped fuel the popular uprising that has sent millions marching into the streets of Chile. All that to come. But first up, here's editor Joel Weber. We put together a little holiday cover for you guys. Yeah, too. quite well, a cover there talking about SoftBank. What a year. Yeah, so we think this is like one of the, the biggest stories of the year, really. And it started with WeWork, which the magazine covered very early on, even pre during the IPO chatter when there was going to be an IPO. But as that coverage sort of developed and went on and on, there was another story that we started to, to think about, which was SoftBank. Right which was one of the biggest investors in WeWork. Obviously. I have to say, I do love the cover season greetings from um, SoftBank. But SoftBank, you know, we did talk about it so much this year. What I love about this story, Joel, is I feel like you guys go into the layers of SoftBank, the Vision Fund, obviously the leader of it all, but there's also other players here. Yeah, that's right. So so Masa being the, mm -hmm. the guy who's really the, vision, the visionary at SoftBank, especially of the Vision Fund, which right. is this outsized force now in Silicon Valley, a $100 billion VC fund that can do a lot of things because it has so much money. And one of the ways that it can do that is go into something like WeWork and basically bankroll WeWork, which is a business model that may not have been right for the long haul yet, right? Right. And it, well, it's funny too, you talk about the business model, right? They were very aggressive. Like Masa pushed that is his the entrepreneurs. Strategy, yeah. Right? Like let's flood the zone with go money. Big. Go big or mm -hmm. go home basically is the, the strategy behind SoftBank. Sometimes that works, to be fair. They have had some wins, but other times it doesn't. And the other thing that this story especially reveals is the culture within SoftBank and specifically the Vision Fund, where there's a lot of tension. Yeah. Yeah. And well, not always great decisions. It's a big story. Another big story is Business Week turns 90. Happy yeah, no, birthday. we're old. We're yeah. really old. It's great. You look great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, it's right. Uh, so yeah, the, the magazine has now been around for 90 years, and we honor that with an essay that looks at how Business Week has actually covered business through the decade. Sometimes we've marked moments in ways that history has not always looked back on so kindly. For instance, there's a 1979 cover about the death of equities that yeah. for a couple of years afterwards, it looked really good. And then, you know, in hindsight, maybe it doesn't look so good now. But it's just an amazing accomplishment that this magazine has been around this long, mm -hmm. always being the authoritative voice on business that we've been. Well, and I do think, and it was so interesting talking to some of the people who really put yeah. together that essay, their combined tenure at the magazine is almost 90 years yeah, that's right. in effect. We don't go all the way back to 1929 <laughs> when, when we first started, right actually before the crash. Yeah. But collectively, the, the people who worked on this essay can actually trace their lineage back to people that they've worked with yeah. who, who did work back then. Yeah. So in, in the course of three people actually we write in the essay, we can actually span the generation. Of and the one of the things that they point out in their essay and they pointed out in conversations with us are these sort of seminal moments and how Business Week in many ways tracked what was going on, the zeitgeist, as it were, in economics, in the boardroom, in right. technology, so many things. Yeah. Women. Women. Uh, and still an issue. <laughs> uh, black business. There's so many tones yeah. in the, the story that when you look at how we've actually covered it, it shows not only the, the evolution of the magazine, but the evolution of the country and of the world in capitalism. Right. But my point, too, is I think those conversations reminding us that some of the issues that we've talked at, you know, about over the decades, we're still talking about them today. And you guys are it's covering It's amazing them. how much stuff comes up in the essay that actually feels contemporary. From, yeah. Yeah. from economics to women in business and finance, all of them are actually, these stories have been with us for actually years. Joel Weber, thanks a lot. More on Business Week's 90th coming up. Let's get back though to the cover story of the tension-filled world of SoftBank's chief, Masayoshi-san. Here's reporter Sarah McBride in San Francisco. WeWork is actually a very small part of their total investment portfolio. We make the point in the article that Masayoshi Son's advisors were much more cautious about WeWork than he was. And in fact, the Vision Fund only committed $4.4 billion to WeWork. I mean, only, <laughs> but compared to the rest of SoftBank, which overall invested $10 billion, more than $10 billion in WeWork, uh, the Vision Fund's commitment was relatively small. So they've got WeWork, and then they've got some much smaller 
companies that have gone wrong, but because they unfolded around the same time as we work, people are paying a lot of attention to them. For example, WAG and Brandless, mm -hmm. two consumer companies that they really only invested a few hundred million dollars in, but because they're high profile, people are paying a lot of attention to those. In a lot of funds, when fa companies fail, they often fail pretty early on in the life of the fund. So we're at this interesting inflection point where they also have a number of very promising companies that aren't quite at the point in their lives where we could point to them and say, wow, these are spectacular companies. But for example, Kupang, a big retailer in South Korea, has a lot of promise. And another one, Tokopedia, also in Asia, is very promising. Mm -hmm. But the promise hasn't delivered yet. The disasters have. So it's just a bad time for them. It is a bad time. What I love about the stories I said at the top is that I feel like you dig into how investment decisions are made. And you also right. give us some insight into Masa as he is universally known. Tell us a little bit about it because sometimes you say you get one Masa and sometimes you get the other. <laughs> right. So Masa can be extremely charming and very interested and engaging or he can kind of get in a bad mood and pepper people with questions. And in the lead, we tell the story of one time on a call where he berated an investor at SoftBank for not being optimistic enough about a company called Full Truck Alliance, which is a company based in China that's making good and steady progress and Masa apparently thought it could grow a lot faster and was telling the investor, you have to figure out a way to make it grow even faster than it is now. And other people on the call were cringing and felt that that one investor got the brunt of Masa's ire. But then other people, particularly company CEOs who go to pitch Masa, if he likes your company, you can walk out just feeling like you're walking on air. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he tells young startup founders, oh, you're the next Jack Ma. And they just leave feeling so good, especially if it's a company where they've been rejected many times before. I think what's interesting in your story, too, is how you say what kind of sets the Vision Fund apart maybe from some other venture capitalists is that when the Vision Fund and when Masa decides to kind of be all in on it, um, they invest big time and they really do push the founders, the entrepreneurs, you know, to kind of be more aggressive in their business, maybe expand out. Right. Right. So they give them the kind of money where they can expand much, much quicker than they would have been able to do otherwise. I mean, sometimes, you know, a company that might have been looking for 50 or $60 million ends up getting several hundred million from SoftBank. So SoftBank gives a lot of money, but then they want you to deliver. So let's say you'd been planning to roll out in one state. Now they want you to do a national rollout and think about what's your overseas expansion plan. So they do set it up for our company to grow very fast, but not every CEO can deliver on that. Coming up, Me Too has yet to have its moment on Wall Street. Why some in the finance industry still don't get it. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Carol Masser. And I'm Jason Kelly. Join us for Bloomberg Business Week every day on the radio starting at 2 p.m. Wall Street time. Also, catch up on our daily show. Listen and subscribe to our podcast. Get that at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or at Bloomberg.com. And, of course, you can find us online at businessweek.com and on our mobile app. In this issue's finance section, a story on the Me Too movement and Wall Street. It's written by Katja Porchikansky and Max Abelson. They've been following this story very mm -hmm. closely throughout the course of the year this piece, it's a sobering article on how the finance industry still doesn't quite get it. Here's more from Max. Sometimes in the newsroom, we sit and look at each other and we're like, you know, 
where is Me Too in the financial services industry? I mean, we know from years of chronicling the hedge funds and banks and private equity and asset management that Wall Street, you know, just like lots of other industries, including journalism, has you know, profound imbalances and women quietly say that they are harassed and discriminated against and assaulted and uh, they, they fear retribution. But we haven't seen that broad moment of change. And what this piece is about is this sort of the system, this like machine of silence that we've discovered piece by piece that, that explains why. All right. Well, because I do think after Me Too in the entertainment world, I think we all thought, OK, Wall Street's next. And it didn't quite happen. I have a word for you. Arbitration. Arbitration, I'm embarrassed to say, is one of those things that, I mean, if we, we've known each other for years, if, if you brought that word up to me two and a half years ago, I'm pretty sure I would more or less draw a blank. Right. In fact, I was on the phone with a Wall Street veteran who said to me, if you really want to understand why we're not seeing Me Too on Wall Street, and this was you know, more than a year ago, she was like, you have to look at the invisibility cloak. And I was like, invisibility cloak? She was like, the system of arbitration. That's the system that's parallel to the courts, and it's behind closed doors. It's a, basically a private justice system mm -hmm. that used to be relatively obscure sort of for you know, fights within an industry. And Wall Street itself really helped it expand so that it now covers essentially two out of three workers at big U.S. companies. And Wall Street, unlike other industries, runs its own arbitration hearings. And it's – Wall Street – definitely a master of arbitration, and it really helps explain a lot. I love this sentence in the story, but the finance industry's mastery of this system, meaning forced arbitration, has prevented the revolution of the past two years from touching it, meaning the Me Too revolution. Yes, and look, I mean, if a Wall Street executive were here with us, um, I talk to them about this all the time. They Men would say, and women? Well, the senior executives <laughs> are all men, but the human resources executives are some, sometimes women. And I've dealt with Wall Street lawyers who are women for sure. And so has Katya and so has Gavin Lynch who is, uh, and Sabrina Wilmer, who both contributed reporting to this piece. They say, look, arbitration, they'll say, is quicker. It's cheaper. It's quieter. Um, but it's just as fair. That's, that's what they'll say. That's their defense of arbitration. You know, women will say it stops us from banding together right. and from learning about each other and from sort of instituting major change. The kind of class action lawsuits that we've written about in the past few years. Right. You can't have those with arbitration. Well, and let's talk about both systemic and cultural aspects as well, because you dig into this too in this piece of you know, the cultures of a lot of these firms – are set up in a way, both structurally and just ethos-wise, that it doesn't feel like a safe place to bring these sorts of complaints. Even the advocates, the, the would-be advocates within the firms, HR, for instance, aren't really on the side of the employees. They're sort of on the side of kind of keeping things quiet and keeping it all under wraps. Our story focused um, on three sort of crystallizing moments. One was Cantor Fitzgerald, which has to do with arbitration. Another was Ken Fisher, who, of course, had those famous comments now at a conference in California. Mm -hmm. And the third was Lloyds of London. I mentioned Gavin Finch, who just did really important, amazing, amazing yeah. work out of London. I mean, like jealousy inducing, you know. <laughs> but what is really upsetting about it, and Katya and I talked about this with uh, Becca, Rebecca Greenfield, our, our editor, you know, what's upsetting about the Lloyd story and a couple others like it is not just that it paints a picture of guys behaving like extremely badly. What's profoundly upsetting about the Lloyd story and another one uh, at a firm called M&G, also in London, that, mm -hmm. and also written by Gavin, is that it gives you a sense that these women went to HR and, and talked about for being assaulted, for example, or being accosted, and that HR was basically like, it'll be bad for your career if you say anything. Yeah. You know, don't mm -hmm. smile around him. I think that was a literal response from human resources at a big institution that Gavin Finch found. Don't smile around him. But Maybe dress differently, you know, like change your behavior in right. order to avoid these situations in the future. Coming up, how climate change primed Chileans for an uprising. Plus, climate defense bringing down the cost of a controversial weapon. This is Bloomberg Business Week.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. And I'm Carol Masser. You can also listen to Bloomberg Business Week on the radio on Sirius XM Channel 119 on AM 1130 in New York, 1061 in Boston, 99.1 FM in Washington, D.C. AM 960 in the Bay Area in London on DAB Digital and through the Bloomberg Business app. A controversial weapon of sorts against climate change, a costly one and some argue a necessary one. Controversial, but I have to say the concept it's pretty yeah, cool. It's Sky vacuums to capture carbon from the air. Here's economics editor Peter Coy with his story in this issue's tech section. Climate change is an economic issue. Yeah, so you're like, well, how do you solve this problem? And uh, there are some obvious things you do. You build more windmills and solar plants and so on. But, but the people who believe that you can capture carbon directly from the air say that that has to be part of the solution as well. How does this even work? Well, carbon dioxide is an acid in chemical terms, so it binds with bases. So if you have a chemical uh, and you run air through it with big fans, then it binds with this, uh, the carbon dioxide in the air binds with this chemical, forms a salt, and then you put the salt through another loop of the uh, equation uh, of the plant, and then you get a different salt, and then you can run that through a heat, a heater, uh, calciner it's called, and then that splits off the carbon dioxide into a pure stream of carbon dioxide, and then you send back lime, which gets uh, hydrated and put back into the process. This is the periodic table at work. I mean, yeah. It really is. It goes back to yes, like basic right. chemistry yeah, yeah. in terms. So it sounds, it makes so much sense. It sounds right? very logical. Yeah. Why aren't we doing it already? Uh, well, we are doing it in an experimental basis. Okay. Um, I, I focus on three companies. One is Carbon Engineering of British Columbia. One is Global Thermostat, based in Manhattan. And the other is Climeworks, based in Switzerland. And the one that's out front is Carbon Engineering, uh, which is um, finishing up the design work on a plant that will pull out one million tons a year of carbon dioxide from the air. Sounds like a lot, is it? it well, it's a huge amount compared to what's been done before, but it's a pittance compared right. to the size of the problem. And so why not do this? Um, it's expensive. It's more expensive than other solutions. Um, and but the, but the cost has come down a lot, so it's no longer crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of on the high end. And it's cheaper than some other options like, uh, say, battery-powered airplanes that we've talked about in the magazine. Um, and furthermore, there will come a point where we've sort of run out our string on some of the solutions like reducing putting carbon dioxide into the air. Right. And at that point... You'll have to think about supplementing with taking some out of the air. And that could be carbon dioxide that was produced by your grandparents. And it's just been sitting out there in the atmosphere all this time. And now it's got to be removed. And I think an important point of this is it's not meant to – it's it's meant to complement or yes. supplement what's already exactly. being done in terms of yes. combating climate change yeah, or I, carbon – the yes. carbon imprint that's out there. And that's there. a really good point because I sort of went into this thinking that maybe someone would read this and be like, pollute all you want. We'll just yeah, vacuum it up. Exactly. And, and people – that's actually, when we're talking about the controversy, that's what some people say, like, it's the wrong message. Don't right. try to tell people that they have a free ticket here to pollute. <laughs> no, definitely not. You, you want to be doing everything, kind of, the low-hanging fruit and some of the high-hanging fruit. Yeah, I like that you refer to this as the high-hanging fruit, which you don't usually uh, read and talk about. So how likely is it that this gets adopted in a meaningful way? I think it's very likely um, because, again, it sort of has to happen. Yeah. Whereas nothing else is going to do the job. So it'll be expensive, but I do believe we've seen the cost curve on solar and wind you know, come way, way down. I think the, the cost curve on this will come down as well. Staying with climate change, there's another story in this issue on how a decade-long drought sparked a popular revolt in Chile. It's in the economic section. Here's editor Christina Lindblad to explain. Most of the coverage of these protests has focused on dissatisfaction over, you know, the economic model and, and how it relates to, you know, meager pensions and, and people feel like, you know, the education system is, you know, is, is producing inequality. The I mean, usual are, suspects, Yeah, right? exactly. But I guess, but we looked at the backdrop of this, which is a 10-year mega drought. We now tack mega in front of these events. And that's been affecting central Chile, which is where most of the population is. 
uh, the north is already very arid. And and so we looked at these water fights, have been pl- I mean, literally, that have been playing out and how these protests kind of, you can't say they literally jumped from rural areas to the city, but there's definitely been this echoes of like unequal access to water equals unequal access to education, unequal access to opportunity, you know? <clears throat> well, tell us about the impact that it's had on, on the lifestyle. I think about farmers in Chile and so much more. How has it played out? So, I mean, we talk to, to you know, people who've lost more than half of their livestock, mm-hmm. you know, in the last couple of years. And, and there's also an area in particular in this valley where avocado farming has, um, you know, spread, of course, uh, to feed this global <laughs> demand for avocados. In particular, right. a lot of exports to the UK out of that valley. And in that instance, it's because basically the, the avocado farmers are being accused of exploiting their water rights that they acquired years ago and also tapping rivers illegally and so all the small farmers in the area um, are you know have have the rainfall has been lacking so they don't have anything to water so the, the avocado crops. farmers are fine yeah but the- I mean if you look at the photos it is stark I mean you'll see these hills that are all brown and on these avocado farms avocado is a really water intensive crop yeah. right. should not really be grown in some of these places so yeah it's just one of those things and, you know and one of the issues that this brings to mind I think is income inequality obviously but also this notion of political and economic choices that favor business over consumers or people Mm -hmm. to get down to it, and sort of businesses even over what I think most would argue is a basic human right. Right. Well, that's right. And I think people were initially surprised about the the sort of the violence of, of these demonstrations in Chile of all places, because it has so often been cited as a model for the rest of Latin America in terms of how it enshrined uh, this neo, neoliberal model, you know, in its constitution, and that constitution dates from the time of the, the dictatorship, and so does a water. This is Pinochet. This yeah, is back to Pinochet, right? right? Mm-hmm. So and so does a water law that basically gives people water rights in perpetuity. So companies, you know, have them forever. They can trade them. You know, there was once upon a time the thought was like free markets will help people. You know. Uh, be careful in the management and use of a uh, finite resource. But that really has not been the case, as we've seen it in some places. Mining and, and sort of and, and kind of export oriented agriculture have really kind of priority have prior the government has prioritized those kinds of uses for water. And so, you know, we have now communities in Chile that depend on water getting trucked in. I mean when they open the faucet, nothing comes out. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's and, and I do wonder, you know, what is the political backdrop here? Because a lot of this unrest, as you said at the beginning of the conversation, has been tied to the political system. Is there any sense that that may change soon? What What's the latest there? Well, I mean, it's the outcome. It may be quite radical in that um, legislators have sat and agreed on two possible means of rewriting the Constitution. So now this consensus in the country is a fair large consensus that the Constitution needs to be rewritten because it enshrines this model that is no longer like, you know, that is that is caused distortion. Yeah, it's essentially not valid right, for the country. Right, So we may see as part of that, I mean, they haven't started talking about how water is going to play into that because that's a separate law, but we, we could see changes in that as well. It's a complete rethinking, basically, of sort of like, what do you want to be as a country? Coming up, Bloomberg Business Week traces its origins to 1929. What a year to be born. There's the first cover right yeah, there. Yeah, not an easy year to make your debut, but there was so much going on, and we take you through the decades of the magazine. We do indeed. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. And I'm Carol Masser. Still ahead, Silicon Valley's take on a tax haven. Plus, a real estate arms race of sorts between two suburbs just north of New York City. The target, millennials. Speaking of millennials, you know what's not a millennial? This magazine? Yeah, <laughs> Business Week. It is turning 90. And to celebrate, the issue looks at how the magazine has covered business 
through the decades. It's a sprawling tale, and to share some of its highlights and history, here's a guy who knows a lot about mm -hmm. it, business editor Jim Ellis. It was a, a, a different magazine. Obviously, we were a different place, different owner, but there were a lot of things that were surprisingly the same. It has always been a big thought that we do more than simply report the news. What we want to do is add insight and, um, you know, add analysis so that the reader can, you know, not just sort of have a chronicle of what happened this week, but also why it's important, why it matters, and what might become of it in the future. And that's the value add that I think has sort of gone all the way through all 90 years. What's really fun is that there are three people. The, the, the section that covers 90 years of Business Week kicks off identifying three people who span the entire lifetime, the 90 years of Business Week. You are one of them. Not that you go back 90 years. <laughs> but what's fascinating is this whole idea of, you know, editors and, and individuals passing down kind of the history of the well, magazine. That's one of the nice things about uh, our magazine is that, you know, there is a lot of continuity. I mean, I work with people who I have literally known for 30 years. Right. And, um, but one of the nice things about that is that we've seen a lot of things happen in business. And there's a lot of context that, you know, we already know. We're not inventing, you know, sort of we're not rushing around. Oh, my God, what is it? I mean, I was there at the opening of Disney World. I'm sort of embarrassed to say I covered that. And, um, you know, I, but I covered the tobacco business in the past. I've been the editorial page editor. I've done a lot of things here. And so a lot of us can easily shift between stories. And we all hopefully can add a lot when we work with younger reporters as well, right. because we've seen a lot of these stories before. One of the roles I believe you played, and keep me honest here, is you were the chief of correspondence. Correct. And so you were dealing with all the outlying bureaus, which for so long, and obviously now in a different context at Bloomberg, that really feeds the magazine in a lot of ways and makes it, uh, gives it a feel, I should say, that is far beyond just a bunch of people in New York putting yeah, together I mean, a magazine. Tell us about that. That's one of the strengths that we've always had is being able to have a bureau system or a system of reporters around the world who are, you know, sort of close to their companies, but also picking up information that it's often difficult to get if you're seven time zones away. But, um, you know, having people in Asia back before uh, you know, before the China handover of Hong Kong, before China was completely open, allowed us to be early on stories like that and to understand a lot of why things either happen very fast or they don't happen nearly as fast as a lot of people in New York seem to think. Right. We've been we've benefited from, you know, A, having those bureaus back in the day, but we're especially benefiting from that now because Bloomberg has a huge editorial staff that we're able to draw on. Tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about, you know, bringing women into the magazine uh, and the consumer, too, like how it's kind of evolved Well, it changed years. because all of a sudden market segmentation became this big deal and also new businesses were popping up because technology was suddenly inventing new industries, new things that were more consumer-focused. And what happened is that, you know, we had to figure out ways to cover that, but also management had to figure out ways to manage that. Mm. So the idea of a professional manager came up. Likewise, we were early on covering women. And, you know, initially we covered women who were you know, a handful of entrepreneurs. Hazel Bishop, who was the woman who invented the... Um, first non-smearable lipstick. And believe it or not, that became a huge business. Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, the woman who uh, uh, was the marketing chief at Tupperware, she made the cover. And um, and so, but, but we didn't really get serious about what happens within corporations for women and the challenges for them until 1975. And we did a, a, a large project um, of a bunch of stories that... Uh, um, I think are still great. I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I was surprised. I reread them for this project, and I was surprised that a lot of the things that people say today, you know, that a man says one thing, a woman says the same thing, and it's, it's considered to be shrill or considered to be, how can you be so pushy? How can you do whatever? Those quotes could have been sort of said by somebody in Silicon Valley this year. So yeah. more than 40 years ago. Yes. And we're still kind of talking yeah. about that. We're still talking stuff. about that. Wow. And so likewise, we started out not doing much coverage of minority business. And a lot of the minority business coverage that we had was pretty bad. And um, I, I had a chance to go back and read some of the early stuff um, all the way up to the 50s. 
And um, in the 60s, because of the changes in society, you know, riots in the streets. So all of a sudden, everybody decided, oh, well, maybe we're going to think about that. Business Week turned into a big place for talking about black empowerment mm -hmm. in business. And um, that was um, it was sort of interesting to see how we took that. We got more sophisticated. And by the time we and by the time the 70s came along and I came along, we were doing um, a lot more coverage and sort of wondering about not just the positives of that, but what about the, the sort of economic sort of changes that seem to be stalling out. We have been really, really good on trying to say, this is how society goes, right. and business people need to know more than just uh, the numbers in the accounting sheet. And for more on Business Week's 90th anniversary. We turn to Bloomberg News' Paula Dwyer. She joined Business Week back in 1985. It was going through a huge transition because it had uh, been a book that was largely covering industrial America. It was largely edited and written by men. It was largely like a, a stapled version of various newsletters about various industries. And then there's this journalist named Steve Shepard took it over and he really changed it. He brought in women. He gave us bylines. He opened a Washington bureau where I was located. He did a lot of things to liven it up and it became... I think, the, the forerunner of the Bloomberg Business Week that we know and love today. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about the different sections, right? Because, and we were talking throughout the week about the 90th anniversary and how everything, I think you used to think it was separate. Politics was here, business was here, technology, and now it's all interconnected. Yes, and um, and the Washington Bureau then, it and Washington, didn't, yeah. they didn't have their own Washington Bureau. They, right. There was a, a an organization called McGraw-Hill World News, which serviced all the McGraw-Hill publications, you know, and that was everything from modern plastics to... Uh, engineering news and and Plastic. so people had a very <laughs> yes people had a very um, trade mentality instead of a narrative mentality or profile men mentality or investigative mentality mm -hmm. or even um, talking about how politics enters into a lot of the business stories and and so the Washington Bureau really changed the look and feel of Business Week. Well, let's talk about that because it does feel like the late eighties and into the early nineties was this seminal moment when Washington seemed to wake up and say, hold on a second, there's business going on that maybe we need to keep an eye on. I think about the LBO era that really got yes. kicked off. Henry Kravis, I believe, yes. uh, showed up on yes. the cover. Well Step back a little bit, and you had what what we call the decade of greed. That yeah. was the '80s, mm -hmm. and it was when people like Mike Milken and Henry Henry Kravis crashed onto the scene. But they were doing things that probably corporate America called for. There 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 had been a lot of CEOs who had had an imperialistic yeah. um, viewpoint about themselves, and they were using shareholder money for fleets of airplanes. I mean, some of them had mini air forces. And so there were some takeover battles, especially the one involving RJR Nabisco that were um, emblematic of the era. And, and so you had these people like Mike Milken, who used the junk bonds, and Henry Kravis, who landed on the cover in, um, uh, I believe it was 1988, as King Henry, and <laughs> um, who who upset all of that and and who shook up the the CEO world? Um, it went a little too far, and as we know, Mike Milken ended up in jail. Henry Kravis is still going strong, right? Um, but some of the people who were involved in this were were shall we say shady characters. Well, it's interesting. Big business certainly got its time in the magazine during that era, but so did consumer advocacy groups. Yes. So a lot of things happened in the eighties and the nineties. It wasn't just decades of greed. I think a lot of big ideas developed in that period. So. So you had um, consumer advocacy that came off of Ralph Nader's 1960s book, Unsafe at Any Speed. But he he birthed a whole generation of um, people who would then go to run advocacy organizations or um, agencies in Washington, like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Consumer Product Safety Commission. There, it was also the era when corporate governance came into being, so when, where shareholders got a voice and, and, and could vote on, on resolutions and could turn out CEOs or could approve or not approve mergers. Um, it was also the era when um, uh, consumerism mm -hmm. rose up. And, and, and it was the era when the retail investor came to be because right. uh, people started to have to manage their, their retirement money through 401ks. And so you finally had um, uh, an, an investor democratization thing going on. 
Coming up from floating tax havens to putting mini city states on land, the latest from Peter Thiel's Seasteading Institute. It's an interesting idea. Plus, New York's commuter towns while they're courting millennials with luxury development. Just throw an accent. <laughs> this is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. And I'm Carol Masser. Join Bloomberg Business Week every day on the radio starting at 2 p.m. Wall Street time. You can also catch up on our daily show by listening to our podcast at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and at Bloomberg.com. And of course, you can find us online at businessweek.com and through our mobile app. We turn now to technology. A former Google engineer and international waters expert is negotiating with officials to put many city states in their countries. This is a real thing. It's a real thing. It's definitely a real thing. Here's editor Jeff Muskis with Lan Ho for Silicon Valley's Seasteaders. Have you heard of seasteading, this idea that uh, gained some currency a few years ago that in Silicon Valley libertarian circles anyway, that um, you you'd, uh, build these little uh, mini sort of floating fortresses just far enough offshore that they weren't wouldn't be subject to U.S. law, for example? Tax haven. Right, yes. And is that what this is all about? Uh, that's at least one one big part of it, although to hear uh, Patrick Freeman tell it, that's, that's not the, the biggest part of what he's after. Well, tell us who he is and what he is after, Jeff. So he's the the guy who uh, sort of co-founded the, the Seasteading Institute a little more than a decade ago uh, with some money from Peter Thiel, the uh, sort of arch-conservative uh, billionaire and gawker slayer. Uh, and Silicon he, Valley guy, but who's also friendly with President Trump. That's right, yeah. Um, this was a, a while before uh, he'd, he'd mm -hmm. forged that relationship, but um, when uh, they tried to sort of get seasteading off the ground, the idea behind this institute was that it would build the, like, the uh, economic and legal framework to sort of set up these little island fortresses off the coast of kind of wherever, and then uh, you know let a let a thousand uh, uh, libertarian tax havens bloom. Uh, that did not go so well for sort of the obvious reasons that uh, attracted charges of, of neocolonialism and, and you know, tax avoidance from uh, local authorities and, and uh, people who, uh, you know, were not psyched to have uh, these sort of seasteads pop up outside their home. The, right. the, the most notable one in the last couple of years was from uh, in a, a case where the, the uh, uh, private company sort of organized it with the help of the Seasteading Institute to try to set up a seastead off the coast of Tahiti, mm -hmm. the Tahitian uh, opposition government, you know, uh, objected on the grounds that this would be pretty disruptive to uh, canoeing and surfing and all the, the other sort of tourism industries. All right. So let's make the pro and con case for it. So Friedman says, why? What, what's what's good about doing this? Well, this is all by way of prelude to his new venture. Uh, so whereas, uh, uh, you know, Peter Thiel, for example, has not uh, cut a check to the Seasteading Institute in more than five years and does not like to talk about it in interviews, as our reporter Lizette Chapman points out in this piece, um, it's sort of on his unofficial do not talk list along with the uh, <laughs> The Blood Boys. Um, the the uh, organization that um, Friedman has just started, a venture fund called Pronomos Capital, mm -hmm. is uh, very much on the, the teal donor list. Teal uh, put up more than half of the firm's $9 million to get started to try and uh, set up uh, basically seasteads, what I would call seasteads on land. Okay. And so what's, what's the case? Who wants this? Is there demand for this? Well, what uh, Friedman and uh, you know some of the people who are, are working with him on the ground in a handful of countries around the world say is that uh, yeah, there, there's interest um, from uh, organizations, whether uh, local economic development groups or just uh, you know interested millionaires, um, who, to set up these kinds of um, uh, mini city states, semi-autonomous cities, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. The the idea, the sales pitch, at least from from Friedman and, and Pronomos, although they're not not working directly, ostensibly, with any of the local governments. They're leaving that to, to secondary agencies. Um, is that you'd set up these uh, semi-autonomous regions, tracts of land under, they say, British common law, um, as adjudicated by retired judges who they'd hire to sort of run things. 
um, and that then they'd be ostensibly uh, immune to local law. Well, and that's what's interesting. I think there's a line in this story that the justice system is more important than the tax breaks. Um, and I think this is Friedman saying that. Mm-hmm. And he talks about some research that suggests faith in a functional code of law of laws is a leading indicator of a region's economic success. So he's basically saying, let's create these. There'll be some law, right, or something. But I guess there's a lot of freedoms as well, and it's going to be economic economically really successful. Yeah, his argument is that the the rule of law is the most important thing, and also Mm -hmm. that, uh, again, this sort of British common law system is adjudicated by retired, in many cases, they're they're hoping British judges, uh, is is the ideal model over any other when Lizette sort of asked him, well, why that as opposed to, you know, any other civilization's code of right. laws or ethics? It, it didn't have the the best answer for people who are worried about colonial impulse. Well, listen, he's gone as far as to say, bum ba da we could solve poverty. Right, yes, that's... That's pretty big uh, claim, that, right? that is one of the loftiest of the of the sales pitches he offered, yeah. Well, you mentioned Peter Thiel is invested in his in his fund, but so is Mark Andreessen yeah. and some other f- well-known folks in the tech community. Yeah, a seri- particularly a series of, um, of uh, Bitcoin advocates uh, like Roger Ver, the guy who's known as Bitcoin Jesus, and some other folks who are, who are very into the idea of building their own system separate from that of the government. Coming up, a couple of New York City suburbs talking about Yonkers and New Rochelle. They've got their eyes on young professionals priced out of Manhattan and Brooklyn. Plus, we talk luxury watches with the Zenith CEO. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Carol Masser. And I'm Jason Kelly. You can also listen to us on the radio on Sirius XM Channel 119, also AM 1130 in New York, 1061 in Boston, 991 FM in Washington, D.C. AM 960 in the Bay Area in London on DAB Digital and, of course, always on the Bloomberg Business app. Well, a real estate arms mm-hmm. race of sorts is heating up between mm-hmm. two suburbs just north of New York City. We're talking about New Rochelle and Yonkers. Well, the two biggest towns in Westchester County are betting on luring affluent urbanites who like their bars and bagels close, but are pretty sick and tired of feeling poor in the Big Apple. Here's Vildana Hyrick. They're not very cool places to live, but these cities, New Rochelle, Yonkers, they're in an arms race trying to compete for new millennials and younger professionals who are looking around and finding that they can't afford to live in places like Manhattan and Brooklyn and Jersey City and Hoboken anymore. And so what they're doing is they're spearheading a number of new developments. They're building thousands of new units in luxury sky-rise apartment buildings, and they're hoping that people will start to move into these new units and start building a family well, in New Rochelle and Yonkers. What's fun about this story, too, is, and in terms of real estate, like the amenities that are involved, and there's something, is it hatchet throwing or something? Yeah, is there a bar? Axe throwing. Axe yeah. throwing? Right. I mean, this is pulling out all stops. I mean, they're trying to do things that appeal to a younger generation, right? Exactly. Both cities are opening or would like to open axe throwing bars. <laughs> and so that's something that they think will be attractive to younger professional people who are um, moving from Manhattan. Well, and it's such an interesting evolution to me, you know, like I live in the Burbs, like mm-hmm. unabashedly in the Burbs, a little north of where we're talking about. And there has for long been, not everyone can be as hip as Carol and like living close into the city. Uh, but the reality is, is that it's always been very binary, right? It's yeah. like you either live in the city or like you're going to the Burbs. I mean, this is trying to find that sort of middle ground and essentially expanding the footprint in many ways of New York City. It is. And the drawing point for both of them, and they would say this, is that they're about 25 or 30 minutes from Midtown Manhattan. You can hop on the train and you can be at work just as fast or maybe faster than you would be living in Brooklyn even. Right. Right. Well, and I think that's a really important yes. distinction. I've thought a lot about this when, you know, I talk to colleagues here in the mm-hmm. New York Bureau of Bloomberg who live in far Brooklyn and 
my commute is shorter and I dare say a little more civilized on the commuter train than many of those because those boroughs, you know, Brooklyn and Queens even, have really pushed further uh, and further out in many ways. Exactly. And that's what they're betting on. They really are hoping that there will be this mass migration of people moving in. And again, these are places where their tax bases were hollowed out in the 70s and 80s. So they really need to reinvigorate. They need to bring new people in if they want to stay relevant. I got to say, and I know you know these towns. I, I I've spent a fair amount of time in New Rochelle. It's near the water and and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is you go around those cities. They're huge. But you can see the streets that are troubled and the retail that's having a hard time. And you can see the results, you know, from those decades of, you know, back in the 70s, you know, when things were doing well and then kind of came undone. I mean, they really are trying to reinvent themselves. I don't think it's going to be easy, though. It's certainly not easy. And there's a couple of risks here. One is that they're going to have so many new units that there's just going to be this huge amount of inventory that they might not be able to fill. And the other thing is walking around the streets and talking to people who currently live in Yonkers, in New Rochelle, they're afraid that their landlords will look around and say, well, maybe I can do some minor renovations in the buildings that that I currently own, and I can hike up rents. And so a lot of residents are fearful that their cost of living will have to go up over the next couple of months or years, and that they'll be driven out of those areas. And from luxury housing to luxury watches we go. And just in time for the holidays, Mm -hmm. you're shopping for me, I know. Here's our interview with the CEO, of the 150-year-old luxury watchmaker, Zenith. If we want to keep young generation, millennials as we call them, interested into mechanical watch uh, watchmaking and not have them not wearing a watch or only a smartwatch, we have to build the future. And that's what we're doing with this one. So it's very connected. Watches are, pardon the pun, sort of having a moment in a way. People are rediscovering the sort of artisan nature in many ways, the craftsmanship that Carol was alluding to. Why do you think that is? Why are people sort of pivoting back mm-hmm. and maybe away from the smartwatch? Well, you know, first of all, you don't have so many objects like a watch. And I think today we, we live in such a fast world. I mean, between the uh, internet, between uh, social media, uh, and don't forget that a watch, a mechanical watch, is one of the few objects that will last forever. Right. If in 1,000 years, you have a watch and you have a watchmaker able to put some oil, it's still going to work. How many objects in this room will still work in 1,000 years? So when you buy a cell phone, when you buy a smartwatch, you know the minute you buy it, it's already obsolete. So I think sometimes people need to attach themselves to something that that will last forever. I do wonder about, and I think about the conversations we keep having about fast fashion and the pushback, this kind of disposable society that we've become, where we used to hold something or our dads would fix something that got broken. And I do wonder if we're kind of channeling back to that. And what are you seeing in terms of your consumer, especially the younger consumer? Because you talk about you've got to invent to bring in a younger generation. Mm -hmm. What do they want in a watch? I think they want, uh, they buy history, they buy authenticity. That's what they want also. Because Mm -hmm. today also we are bombarded bombarded by uh, marketing, com- communication, publicity everywhere, and they want to buy something with substance, with content. So they often ask us questions about how it's made, how long does it take, basically what's behind the brand and what's behind the price. What do I pay when I get a watch? So we have to to show them the savoir-faire and how many hours a watchmaker uh, is working on a watch. So that's super important. But also, we need to show them creativity and innovation. Bloomberg Business Week is available on newsstands now. And also online at businessweek.com and on our mobile app, Your Must Read. It's the Business Week 90th anniversary. I love it. I love talking to those guys. 90 years, not a millennial to say the least. That magazine, it's seen some things and had a huge amount of influence on issues of the day, which, by the way, still the issues of the day. Well, that's what's really remarkable, whether it's about racial issues, women on Wall Street, those issues were talked about decades ago. We're still talking about them today. What's also important, you talk about influence, Jason, and that is really key in terms of kind of pushing government sometimes on policy. I mean, this was really um, the word of record, if you will, when it comes to business. And continues to be, and that's why we love it. Check out our daily Business Week podcast. It's available at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and at Bloomberg.com, our Business Week Extra this week, it's with the CEO Bombas. Good stuff. More Bloomberg Television starts now. <laughs>